this video, we're going to look at a brief introduction to radiation. We'll talk about the spectral and directional nature of radiation. We'll talk about the hemisphere and solid angles. And we'll define radiation intensity and the emissive power, which are tools that we'll need to move forward in our study of radiation heat transfer. Radiation is different than all the, the other two modes of heat transfer that we've been studying, convection and conduction, in that it doesn't require a medium. It is directionally dependent, that is, the radiation uh, can vary with different directions, and you probably are well uh, familiar with this. Uh, simply from standing in front of a campfire, you can feel the radiation coming from that fire quite strongly, uh, whereas if you turn around and face the other way, you no longer feel that radiation, or if you move to another location, you feel it quite differently depending on that direction. But it's also a function of wavelength. And so let's think about the electromagnetic spectrum, which talks about the different types of radiations based on their wavelength. And of course, we convert, convert uh, the wavelength into a frequency through this relation here, where C is the speed of light. So thermal radiation is that radiation that is really between 0.1 micrometers and about 1,000 micrometers. If we go to smaller wavelengths, we're getting into cosmic radiation and, and gamma radiation. And if we have, we have x-rays and ultraviolet down there, and uh, at uh, larger wavelengths, we get to radar and TV and things like shortwave. Uh, so we're concerning ourselves largely with this spectrum here for the thermal radiation, where we're transferring uh, the bulk of the, uh, of the energy, or the thermal energy. And a very small subset of this is the visible spectrum, going from our uh, purple light at uh, 0.4 microns up to our red light at about 0.7 microns. Going larger from that, we get into the near-infrared and the far-infrared, and of course, uh, these are the things that we're going to see uh, when we use thermal cameras, is the infrared spectrum at these higher, uh, larger, longer wavelengths or shorter frequencies. And so the, the characteristics of a radiation may depend very, very much on what that wavelength, uh, what that particular wavelength is, and that's something that complicates our analysis, and we have to learn how to uh, understand and manage that. And that behavior may be very, very complex. Uh, this is a, a plot showing the emissive power that we'll talk about momentarily, um, <coughs> which is not of a black body, so ignore that B, um, of a surface, and we have a range of wavelengths over part of that region, the region that we talked about for our thermal radiation from our point 0.1 to about 1,000. And this is the energy that's being emitted per unit area at each one of these wavelengths. And we may see highly fluctuating functions like this, where there are reasons why certain wavelengths are emitting less than, than others. And so that can make our study incredibly complicated, and we'll need some tools for simplifying that and, and being able to do engineering calculations, even though the, the detailed nature of the variations can be incredibly complex. As I mentioned, the radiation can be very directional. If we look at a, a real surface, it may well be very, very uh, directional in that when we look at that normal direction of the surface, we'll see the highest amount of radiation being emitted from it, whereas if we go to smaller and smaller angles, uh, we see less uh, angles that are closer and closer to parallel to the surface, we're seeing a smaller emission of radiation. It simplifies calculations greatly if we can assume that the surface is diffuse, that is, it emits the same amount of radiation in all directions. And you can imagine that different surfaces will behave differently. You'll get a very specular reflection from a mirror. That is, you'll have the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. And if we have a very rough surface, then we'll get a much more diffuse surface. But in the bulk of our calculations, or in fact all of our calculations in this course, we're going to assume that it is diffuse, that it is the same in every single direction. Now, if we imagine a surface, and there's going to be uh, radiation emitted from this surface, the radiation is going to leave that surface, and it's going to spread out over a hemisphere. Right? The radiation has to leave uh, in a direction away from the surface, so it can only go in half of a sphere surrounding the surface, and that's the hemisphere above the surface. So all the radiation is going to come out of this hemisphere. So we're going to be able to integrate over these hemispheres in order to do our radiation calculations. We're going to have to make some definitions here. We'll define the azimuth angle, which is the angle as we move in a circle around the plane of the surface. And we also have the zenith angle, which is the angle from the perpendicular of the surface uh, moving down towards the parallel to the surface. And these two, these two angles will define anywhere we are within this hemisphere. We also need to define the concept of a solid angle. Now, a solid angle 
is nothing other than the two-dimensional uh, represent two-dimensional analog of our uh, normal two-dimensional angle. If you recall, when we have a differential angle d theta, which has an arc length ds, we know that ds is equal to r d theta, or our differential angle d theta is equal to that surface, that arc length, divided by the radius. And the solid angle is just the two-dimensional analog of that. We have an area subtended by a differential solid angle, and similarly, the differential area subtended by a differential solid angle is that differential area divided by the radius squared. This will be a useful tool moving forward. Of course, I can calculate what dan, dan is. This arc length here is rd theta, and this one here, we need the, the projection r sine theta, which will give us this length here, and r sine theta times d phi gives us this dimension, and so multiplying those two together gives us what this area dan is. Clean that up, and it's r squared sine theta d theta d phi, and of course, now I can use my definition of my differential solid angle up here in order to get an expression for d uh, omega, this differential solid angle, which is sine theta d theta d phi. We'll use this moving forward. Now, of course, if I want to integrate over the entire hemisphere, I'm going to integrate the azimuth angle theta from 0 to pi by 2, and I'm going to integrate the azimuth angle d phi from 0 to 2 pi. That will bring me the full way around, and that will cover the entire hemisphere. Now, of course, this is an integral that I can evaluate quite easily, and I see that in a hemisphere there are 2 pi steradians. The unit for a solid angle is steradians, just like the unit for our normal angle is radians. So in a hemisphere there are 2 pi steradians. Now I'm going to find the radiation intensity. I sub E, which is for the emitted radiation from this surface, and that is simply the energy emitted, so that will be a number in watts per unit time, sorry, the energy in joules per unit time, which gives me watts. It's going to be per unit uh, wavelength at the wavelength lambda, so per micrometer. It will be per unit solid angle, so that's steridian, that's per unit solid angle on my hemisphere, and it's going to be per unit area perpendicular to the emission direction. So if I'm looking down at this surface here, of course I don't see this surface area here, I see the projection of this surface. And that projection of this surface as seen looking down from this solid angle is dA cos theta. And so this radiation intensity has units of watts per meter squared steridian micrometer. And I can uh, start working with that by saying that is dQ is that amount, or that power, those, that number of watts, that left this surface and passed through the, this element of differential solid angle. I can, of course, rearrange this for the energy uh, for any given wavelength, or the energy per unit wavelength, um, rearranging this. And I'll call this quantity dq lambda, because it's a function of my wavelength. I can, of course, divide that by my area, uh, which cancels out my dA, and now I have the heat flux, the watts per meter squared, which is leaving this surface and passing through this differential solid angle, this area subtended by this differential solid angle. Okay, so now I want to get to the spectral hemispherical emissive power. In order to do that, we need to integrate the radiative heat flux over all the directions. So we had our expression for what that dq, uh, the heat flux per unit wavelength was, was our radiation intensity times this cos theta because of the projection uh, normal to my viewing angle over a differential solid angle d omega. Now d omega we saw earlier was equal to sine theta d theta d phi, so I can substitute that into my expression, and I can integrate over my hemisphere, so that is integrating the zenith angles from 0 to pi by 2 and the azimuth angles from 0 to 2 pi of my dq prime lambda. Substituting that in, I get this expression here. And that is my spectral hemispherical emissive power. Spectral because it's a function of wavelength. This will be the energy at a given wavelength uh, integrated over the entire hemisphere that is left, the energy that has left my surface.
this emissive power in general is a function of wavelength and my direction in the hemisphere, and that's where we have a problem. This would be a very complex function if this was differing over all of the hemisphere. But if, as we will do in this course, we will make the assumption that the surface is diffuse. And if the surface is diffuse, then my radiation intensity is not a function of direction anymore, and I can pull it outside of the integral sign. And now, once again, I have an expression that I can easily evaluate this double integral analytically and see that that integral over the hemisphere is in fact pi, not 2 pi as before, as we have an extra term in here, it's a different integral, and it evaluates to pi. And so my spectral hemispherical emissive power, the energy per unit wavelength, which is emitted at a given wavelength, is pi times the intensity uh, at that wavelength. And that, of course, has units of watts per meter squared per micrometer. Now finally, if I want the total hemispherical emissive power, I need to integrate the spectral emissive power over all wavelengths. So I need to integrate that quantity from wavelengths from 0 to infinity, and that will now give me something which has units of watts per meter squared. So if I had a directional radiation, I have this complex uh, expression for the uh, spectral emissive power, and I need to additionally integrate that over the entire range of wavelengths. So that's my entire integration that I have there. And of course, this is giving me a number that is in watts per meter squared. So remember, we're integrating over a hemisphere. We're getting the energy per unit area of this hemisphere. And so if we're very close to the surface, this will be a small surface area and we'll have a high energy density. And if we, in, if, if we get farther and farther away, this, hem, this hemisphere gets larger and larger. And so, of course, we'll have a smaller amount of energy per unit area. Um, but of course, the total amount of energy is conserved. It's just spread over a larger area since we're farther away. These are the basic, some basic definitions that we'll be using moving forward in our study of radiation heat transfer.